And then I'll share one more tip. This might be the most important piece of advice I've ever gotten, maybe in my life, and I call on it all the time. And that is the idea that we have to trust our future selves to handle future problems. Mm. We have to imagine that the version of ourself that will handle this thing in the future that we're so worried about, that version of us will handle it. And expecting our present self to know how we're going to deal with that is unfair because future us, they have more time, they have more wisdom, they have more experience, they're going to deal with it. And our job right now is only to handle what's true right now. So when you're feeling anxious, bring yourself back into the present, see what is in your control in this moment and focus on that because past you trusted you to handle present moment. Present moment has to handle future you to handle the future. Emily, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so we actually connected similar to Kat Cole, who was the, an episode or two ago in a clubhouse room. So if people haven't been following that well, there's this new call, a call in inverted commas, <laughs> um, app where people can kind of have like audio conversations in chat rooms. Kind of reminds me of like Yahoo chat back in the day. And uh, we, we spoke a few times on there and you've been hosting these awesome events on there where people are talking about mental health, anxiety, imposter syndrome, and all these different things that you're an expert in. So today we're gonna to be digging into a lot of those topics and hopefully helping people figure out how they can help themselves. Um, but before we dig into that, I'd love just to paint a picture of who you are and your background. Absolutely, so I'm a clinical psychologist. I've been practicing almost 11 years now, but I grew up in Silicon Valley. So I've always had a real interest in the psychology of the entrepreneur. I've always found it interesting that there is kind of a particular psychology to the type of person who wants to take on this slightly masochistic path of starting a company. So while I was in grad school, I did a bunch of research on what makes someone emotionally healthy. My goal was that I really wanted to shift the narrative of mental and emotional health from being this reactive thing that we only pay attention to when we're unwell to being a proactive thing that we pay attention to to maintain wellness and to promote wellness but I didn't necessarily know what proactive mental health would look like. So I did this research project. It's called an interpretive phenomenological analysis. That's just a fancy way of saying that I interviewed a hundred psychologists and entrepreneurs. And I said to them, how would you know if you were sitting across the table from an emotionally healthy person? What would those practices look like? What would it feel like to be with them? So I took all the interviews, I transcribed them, I coded them for themes. And what came out of this research was this idea of these seven traits of emotional fitness, these seven things that you'll see in people who are ongoing, proactive emotional fitness, you know, advocates and users. And so these seven traits are self-awareness, empathy, the ability to play, curiosity, mindfulness, resilience, and communication. So I took these seven traits and I started building content about them. My background in psychology is kind of the classic Freudian depth-oriented psychology, and I wanted to figure out how to make that more modern and more accessible around these seven traits. So I started doing talks at all kinds of amazing companies like Indiegogo and GitHub, Asana, Spotify, and it was amazing to see that people were really receptive to the idea of treating their mental health more like going to the gym instead of like going to the doctor. And then about two years ago, I met an amazing woman named Alexa Meyer, who's now my co-founder. And we started a company called COA. And COA essentially at its heart is a emotional fitness studio offering free therapist-led classes 
that are really rooted in community. And we also help people find a really great therapist for them. So right now we have classes on things like imposter syndrome and managing political anxiety and how to be living alone at home right now and all kinds of the things that are on people's mind. And the idea is there are people who've spent the last decade to three decades of their life learning about the human condition, these therapists, and we wanted to give them a platform and help them help other people live a more proactively healthy life. The program I went through, it's called the PsyD. It's like a PhD, but it's less research-based and more clinically oriented. So I started seeing patients my first year of grad school before I had any idea what I was doing. They throw you right in the deep end. <clears throat> and I spent nine years learning, taking classes, seeing patients, having supervision, being in my own therapy, and just understanding that the human condition is very complex and realizing that the world wants it to be simple and quick to change, and that's just not actually the case. And so I have a real deep respect for the idea that if it were easy to change, we would have done it already, and we should be honoring the fact that we are the way we are for a reason, and it takes real work to change, just like it takes real work to become more physically fit and healthy. The same is true with our emotional health. Just looking at this area, I think there's a lot of people who have barriers, like they put barriers up, for themselves or they might actually have real barriers um, like not being able to afford therapy for example um, so I'd love to dig into some of those in a minute but um, I guess what are the most common ones you hear I'm assuming it's like I don't have time for that which normally is more of a priority problem um, or like obviously if not really knowing where to start so the time one is big of course we're all really busy and you're right that it's a it's a question of priorities but the thing that I also like to tell people is what I think we often don't realize is the amount of time we spent kind of preoccupied by all the things in our mind and everything we're overwhelmed with, that ends up being a lot more of your time than going to therapy for one hour a week would be. And that actually by having a dedicated space to work through everything that's going on with you, you free up all this other time the rest of the week to focus on the things that you have to do. So you actually make yourself time, I believe, when you're doing this kind of work. So that's one of them. In terms of what I think stops people, I think it really comes down to friction and stigma and access. Mm. So access is about the fact that therapy is not widely affordable. It's very frustrating, I know, but people don't realize that there are some great options out there. There are sliding scale clinics that offer therapy for really reasonable amounts of money. We at COA have these free therapist-led classes that certainly give you a type of therapeutic experience, that kind of thing. And then some people think that they can't afford it because maybe they don't realize what a profound difference it would make in their life and they perhaps just don't value how important it can be. Yeah. In terms of friction, it's just really hard to get started in our culture right now. It's, I don't know if you've been on psychology today or any of these places, but it's kind of a clusterfuck. Like it's so, there's so much, you don't know what kind of therapy do I want? Where should I go? People are full. You know, what, uh, what do I do to get started? It's very overwhelming. And so that's also what we are trying to fix at COA, which is giving people a really easy place to start. And we do all of that work for them. And then lastly is the stigma. And that's something that I think is shifting, but maybe not fast enough. Many people, many cultures still feel like therapy is something you only do if you're broken or if there's something wrong with you. But my belief is that waiting to do therapy until you're really struggling is little like waiting to do cardio until you've been told that you have early signs of heart disease. Like you should start when things are mostly fine and you end up building your resilience muscles such that you can face the difficulties of life and perhaps not end up struggling with some of the mental health issues that send people to therapy later. So think about your mental health like going to the gym. Do it now. Make it part of your everyday life. Yeah, I love that position in rather than just like when something's broken. It's kind of like a wider conversation about health in general, not just mental health. I think um, I just had another guy on recently where we talked a lot about um, metabolic health. Um, he's a fan of levels. If you've seen the, the continuous glucose monitor company uh -huh. and it's the same issue, right? Like we're kind of told you go to the doctor and they'll say, okay, now you've got diabetes. Now take these pills or have, have insulin if you need it. And, and that's way too late. We want to be doing that way before ahead of time. Um, and I guess the two areas, again, looking as an amateur, there's, there's like depression, and anxiety, like are two big areas that you hear those words used all the time. 
Um, but there's also just people who need someone to speak to or need to, you know, talk about stuff and and think about things in a different way. What, like just those two areas, depression, anxiety, are they related? The way I distinguish the two is depression is being preoccupied by the past and anxiety is being preoccupied by the future. And the thing that I feel frustrated about when it comes to these words is you hear the word depression and you automatically assume some kind of major mental illness. Mm. But actually, depression is different than the diagnosis, which is major depressive disorder. Everyone experiences depression. We all ruminate about our past. We all have regrets and get stuck in patterns of thinking and feel sad in ways that we can't get ourselves out of. That's something that happens to all of us. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're mentally ill. Same with anxiety. We all worry about the future. Right now, especially, is one of the least certain times we've ever experienced as a society. And so there's a ton of anxiety. And I would be surprised if someone didn't have a little bit of anxiety. But then, of course, you can get to the point where it's really interfering with your life. And when that happens, obviously, it's a different situation. But I guess what I'm trying to say is it's not like people with mental illness are over here and the rest of us are over here. It's a spectrum that we're all on. We all have work to do. We could all be in better mental health than we are now. And in fact, the more we all do that, the better position we'll be in to help others who are struggling more. I completely agree. So let's say I'm listening to this or even myself right now and I say, this is great. I want to get my act together. Like where should someone start today? You, you mentioned some of those things a bit earlier, um, but just, you know, but is there like, if you were thinking of a decision tree, where to start, like what would that look like? Well, obviously I'm biased, but I really think every single person should give therapy a try. It, you mm. know, it can be frustrating because the first person you try isn't always the best and having to find someone you can afford is frustrating. But when you land in the right place, it is such a profound change. Like every single thing that is beautiful about my life, I credit to the work that I did in therapy. I really think it's the best choice a person can make. That being said, there's all kinds of other things we can do. You can take up a meditation practice. You can journal every day so you're more in touch with what's going on in your mind. You can invest in community and making sure you're surrounding yourself with people who also value working on their mental and emotional health. I would love for people to go to joincoa.com and join our classes, build community. There's all of these people who think, yeah, I should do the work on myself to benefit the people around me. Surround yourself with those kinds of people. It makes a huge difference. And, you know, one of the things I say is if you want the mental health of the world around you to change, you have to start with your own. Mm. I think we often talk about who in our life should be working on these things without taking responsibility for the fact that it really starts with us. So, you know, do anything you can to prioritize it in your life. I think that part of why people feel like it's not possible is a defense against the fact that it's hard and that it's uncomfortable and that it's scary and who really wants to think about all the painful things they've been working hard not to think about? Obviously, none of us do. But on the other side of that, on the other side of facing difficult things, on the other side of becoming more comfortable, being uncomfortable is the life that you want to live. It's an investment that's worth making. And I know from experience, both as a therapist and as a patient, that it works and that it's, it's worth doing. Yeah, people should definitely go to joincoa.com and check out the, both the classes and therapy if you are able to uh, sync up with one. Apart from um, your website, obviously, but like if someone's listened to this and they're in the UK or they're in Europe or anywhere around the world, um, I don't think you guys service everywhere yet, right? The classes do. Anyone anywhere can join the classes. The therapy matching we're currently doing in California and we'll be expanding from there soon. Cool. Um, what would you recommend for people to find their own therapists wherever they live um, if, if COA isn't the solution for them? I don't think it's the same in every place. And I can say that the system's really frustrating and broken, which is why we decided to start this company in the first place. I can say one of the best places to start is through referrals. So if you know of or come across anyone who's in therapy and they really like it, if they're really close to you and it, you probably shouldn't see the same therapist as them, ask them to ask their therapist for recommendations of other people who they really trust, who you can try. Or if this is a person you're not super close with and they like their therapist, then maybe you also give their therapist a try. I have to say, unfortunately, there are some bad therapists out there. And so it is really helpful to start with people who are already happy with their experience. The next thing I'd recommend is educate yourself a little bit on what the different types of therapy are. 
because therapy works really different depending on the modality. There is therapy that kind of lives under the umbrella of something called psychodynamic, psychoanalytic therapy. That's what I do. And that's more depth oriented. It's, it takes longer, but it's about really getting in there, cleaning out the wounds, understanding your patterns, making real long-term sustainable change from the inside out. And then there's another branch of therapy that kind of lives under the umbrella of CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, that's more about symptom management. It's about helping you change your thought patterns. That kind of therapy is really good if you're really struggling and suffering and you need help right now. And maybe it doesn't matter as much why you are this way. You just need help feeling better immediately. So educating yourself on that will help you start to point in a direction. And then just start trying people. I sometimes liken therapy to dating a little bit where it's unlikely that you're going to have love at first sight and know that this is the person you want to be with forever. Sometimes you have to try a couple people and just see who you're comfortable with. And my litmus test for a good therapist is the first time you're frustrated with them or it's not going the way you want or you feel like they've let you down, can you tell them that? And are they able to work with you to understand it as a microcosm example of all the other frustrations you're probably having in your life. Can they sit there with you and, and work through it together? That you've definitely made the case for therapy and, and hopefully people listen to this will at least try to explore that in their, in wherever they live. I've heard you talk a bit about anxiety specifically because I think during this time that we've all been going through this year, um, even myself, I can speak personally, like I've had physical anxiety from like chest, like breathing stuff. <laughs> and just like I'm a pretty chilled out person overall, but I think it's I've really felt this year and people that I know have had a similar issue. So with anxiety specifically, is there anywhere you would say someone should um, should start with that, trying to even just diagnose that they are feeling that and figuring out what they can potentially do about it? Anxiety is a big one. We're all feeling it a lot right now. And I'm seeing it, especially, for example, in founders who are trying to run a company in all of this madness. We actually had a 900% increase in people requesting our services. So clearly there is a mental health situation happening for sure. One thing I do know is that people who work on their emotional health in a proactive way tend to handle the unknown and uncertainty and all of those things a little bit better. It's sort of like when you work out and then you're in a complicated physical situation, you're sort of like, okay, well, I know my body can handle this because I've been working out. So I definitely uh, want to encourage people to start thinking about their mental health now. But if I could give a couple suggestions for dealing with anxiety, one of them would be don't underestimate the connection between your mental and physical health. If you're not exercising and you're not sleeping well and you're not eating healthy, you should expect to be anxious and a little bit depressed because our bodies and minds are so connected. So even though it's complicated because when you feel crappy, it's harder to motivate yourself to work out, etc. If you can push past that, if you can find the action potential for it, you will see benefits in your mental health. So that's one of them. The next thing is feel your feelings acknowledge that this is a tough time. Stop shoving things away and expecting that they're going to go away. The things we don't face follow us around all the time. So one of the ways to do this besides therapy is schedule time to worry. I know this sounds a little strange, but if you notice that you're so anxious that you're distracted all through your day, put an hour on your calendar every day where all you have to do is sit and worry. And you can ruminate and you can think and you can feel upset and you can write stuff down and whatever it might be. And then the rest of the day, when you start to worry, you say, nope, this is not my worry hour. I'll let six o'clock me deal with this. <laughs> for now, I'm going to focus on what I need to do. But then that space is still held for you. And so, you know, the purpose of anxiety is it makes us feel more in control. And that's really hard to give up. And so giving yourself a little bit of time. And then I'll share one more tip. This might be the most important piece of advice I've ever gotten, maybe in my life, and I call on it all the time. And that is the idea that we have to trust our future selves to handle future problems. Mm. We have to imagine that the version of ourself that will handle this thing in the future that we're so worried about, that version of us will handle it. And expecting our present self to know how we're going to deal with that is unfair because future us, they have more time, they have more wisdom, they have more experience, they're going to deal with it. And our job right now is only to handle what's true right now. So when you're feeling anxious, bring yourself back into the present, 
See what is in your control in this moment and focus on that because past you trusted you to handle present moment. Present moment has to handle future you to handle the future. I love that. That's really helpful um, to think through. I've also read in some of your work, you've talked about with anxiety specifically that one of the common things you need to do is to identify triggers. And like, could you explain like what that actually means? By that, I just mean we each have a really unique relationship to anxiety. What makes me anxious might not make you anxious, Mm. right? And those triggers usually have to do with our past experiences and things that have felt scary or dangerous in the past. And so we're trying to protect ourselves now. And so getting to know yourself better, understanding what situations are tough for you or anxiety provoking for you are really powerful because then you can build shock absorbers around it. So for example, if you know that you have a lot of anxiety when you're in, I don't know, let's say social situations, then before you go out and have a social situation, maybe you sit yourself down, give yourself a pep talk, take a couple deep breaths, schedule a really relaxing activity for when you get back. You can kind of bolster your ability to handle these tough things just by knowing yourself a little bit better. And, and then I've also heard you talk about understanding the healthy and unhealthy reactions to adversity. So like even just looking at myself, again, I'll just try to volunteer information here as much as I can. Um, like I know in the past when I've been stressed out at work or someone's annoyed me, there's like two ways I can react. I can go off a cliff <laughs> and just say, F it, I'm going out, I'm doing this, I'm going to distract myself and you can go down a really slippery slope. And then the other side of me is someone who becomes really motivated out of that and says, okay, I'm going to prove them wrong or I'm going to uh, work even harder. I'm going to learn more if this was at school. Is that kind of what you mean by those two different types of reactions or am I misunderstanding that? I think that's a great example. But one thing that I'd caution people is sometimes we think getting upset bad pretending everything's okay, good. And that's not necessarily true. Sometimes the healthy reaction to adversity is being angry or being upset or grieving and mourning the loss of something, right? There's, like you said, there's a slippery slope where sometimes it gets to a place where it's not helpful to us anymore. But I think the healthy versus unhealthy reactions is, are we making this choice to escape something or are we making this choice to take care of ourselves And we tend to want to escape. Nobody likes to feel uncomfortable. I I just want to really try to give permission and support to people around the idea that if you don't feel it, you won't heal it. That when you're facing a tough thing, give yourself a little bit of time to feel your feelings about that tough thing and then keep pushing forward and move toward healthier reactions. So there's um, a psychology term that I love called sublimation. It's a healthy type of defense mechanism. Sublimation is when you channel a feeling that's sort of socially unacceptable into a socially acceptable behavior. So let's say you're really angry about something. It's probably not acceptable to break glass in someone's house, but it's also not healthy to shove your anger down into your body and pretend that it's not real. Sublimation means find a way to express the anger, but in a healthy way. So maybe you take a boxing class or go for a run, or maybe you take a bunch of plates and go somewhere with safety goggles and smash them and then turn them into a beautiful art mosaic, whatever it might be. Finding healthy ways to deal with complicated feelings. That's, I love that plate example, by the way. That's, I feel <laughs> like you might have done this. I might have. <laughs> <laughs> when I have gone through a tough period in the past at work, maybe a few years ago, like I started playing squash, um, like in the States is squash, but also racquetball, but it's just the, the sport where you whack the ball as hard as you can against a wall and you're running around sprinting is probably one of the best sports for dealing with stress for me anyway. It's cathartic. I'd love to go into a couple common scenarios and this is going to be a mix of personal stuff that a lot of people go through slash work business related stuff. And I know it, you know, it might take 10 therapy sessions to really come to a resolution. So I'm not expecting you to give us something to fix something on this podcast, but I'd love for us to maybe go through a few quick hits. Like there might be things that you would recommend uh, to someone going through a a situation like this. So um, the one that I've dealt with personally, and a lot of people who listen to the show have emailed me and asked me, Hey, Bilal, I've been working for years and I'm losing motivation or I've got this business and I was loving it and now I've just lost motivation. And I guess like most people lose motivation at some point or they kind of hit 
this like slump where they've lost their purpose. And is there any advice you have around dealing with something like that? Well, firstly, I want to recognize that in these times, I'm actually seeing a ton of this. And I don't think it always necessarily has to do with not enjoying a person's work anymore, but rather the fact that there are certain things that just don't feel important right now because of mm. everything else that's going on in the world. It's hard to justify all of the hustle porn that's pushed on us working at all costs when we're not able to refill our tanks doing the things we would normally do because it's such a complicated time. So I want to say I actually think it's kind of normal right now to maybe not feel exactly the same about your work and about your choices as you normally would. So part of this is like just giving yourself some self-compassion and understanding that this is not par for the course, that there's no playbook for this and we're all kind of just doing our best. So there's definitely some of that. Beyond that though, what I really try to remind people is that things are rarely as simple as they seem. When a person comes to me and says, oh, I'm just not motivated anymore, it's rarely as simple as just, oh, okay, you should probably just switch jobs. There's usually all kinds of stuff that lives underneath it. Self-esteem feelings or not feeling appreciated or validated or not taking care of yourself in other ways so there's no gas in your tank to push through work or realizing that you made this choice in a different phase of your life and that things have shifted and you've grown or... You know, there's just so many complicated reasons why we have these feelings that I firstly suggest not to make any huge sweeping changes in your life before you really take the time to examine what might live underneath the emotion and perhaps get support from a therapist or a friend or loved ones who you trust to work through some of that. And then the other thing is the idea that, you know, there's this quote that floats around out there that like, if you find work you love, you'll never work a day in your life. I call bullshit on that. That's yeah. just not true. Nobody has a job they love every single day. No matter what we're doing, we're going to be frustrated and not want to do it some of the time. And so I think part of it is just normalizing. If you're not feeling motivated and having a tough time, check in with yourself. When's the last time you took a proper vacation? When's the last time you spent prioritized time taking care of your body so that you could keep pushing through? How honest and known and seen do you feel by your colleagues? Is it a place you feel safe and is there some work that needs to be done there? Just examine what might live underneath and around some of these things and sometimes the problem will look like something different. Yeah, it's definitely something that right now I, I've felt the same where there's so much going on and things that used to feel really important right now are just kind of on the back shelf and you're like, well, that's not really important. I'm alive and breathing and most of the people I know are okay. So, you know, that's kind of like one way of looking at it but i guess there's other people who kind of slip down into this like negative spiral and you know and, and that's understandable because everyone's in a unique position what you're mentioning too this feeling of like oh well there are people dying and there's other stuff going on you know there's a term for that it's called survivor guilt survivor mm. guilt is the idea that we sometimes feel uncomfortable and guilty when we are surviving or thriving in ways that other people are not surviving or thriving. So I see this a lot, especially with founders, with people who have privilege, where they're like, who am I to feel depressed right now? I have a house, I have a job, there are people who are homeless and you know all kinds of crazy things. And the problem with that is discounting our own problems doesn't make them go away. And there will always be people with worth, worse problems than us. And we have to mm -hmm. honor that what's true for us still matters. And the more we take care of ourselves, the more we're in a position to help people less fortunate than us. So, you know, you do have to put your own airplane mask on first. Uh, I guess the counter view, though, and I love your opinion on this, is when you're trying to be grateful, and that's another word that we all hear a lot of right now, gratitude, being grateful. Like, what's the difference between saying okay well, other people are doing worse and therefore i should feel grateful versus like what you just mentioned there i don't know that there is one really neat and tidy line between those two things mm -hmm. i think the goal is to have both like gratitude is a really powerful practice it, it can sound a little woo but the truth is gratitude is a great antidote to anxiety because if anxiety is fear of what may or may not happen in the future Gratitude is grounding you in what's true and beautiful right now. So it's a great way to bring you back into the present and to think, well, what is true in my life right now that feels good? In what ways can I ground myself in the things that I've worked hard for and the community that I have, et cetera? I think it's a great practice. I recommend people think about what they're grateful for every, every single day. 
that being said, we're still allowed to feel like the world's unfair and frustrated and angry that things aren't better. And, you know, that is all human emotion too. So I guess what I'd say is you should have a balance. And if you notice that for too long, you're only living in one space or the other, then it's probably time to figure out how to open up a little space for the full range of human emotion. I'm going to ask a question that you just mentioned something there that triggered this thought. And on average, a lot of my friends who are guys, and of course, this isn't all guys, and if, and this is people who identify as being a guy versus woman. I've felt from my point of view that a lot of them jump to this solve or like, OK, well, here's a problem and now let's fix it. And whereas a lot of my female friends um, will often say, look, look, it's OK to feel it. And like even my girlfriend, she'll say to me like, OK, you don't need to fix it all the time. You just need to like feel it. And I've got a lot better at that because of her. And I'm able to just say, OK, this, there's something wrong here and I don't need to like have a solution straight away. Um, my first question is just from your experience, because you work with hundreds or thousands of people and you've done lots of research. I'm curious from your point of view, if you've seen that, too. I mean, I think you're coming up against a complicated thing, which is we want to group people. It makes it easier to understand. Our brain does this naturally. We try to figure out what the patterns are so that we can predict a future thing. I think you're probably right that if we were to average it out, the tendency to move away from feeling to logistical and rational stuff is more a male thing. But I'd argue that it's not because the male brain is incapable of those things, but more because society has told men that they're not supposed to stay in feelings and they're not supposed to be as emotive. And I think that's changing now, where I think we're starting to realize that it's better for everyone if men are allowed to feel their feelings. And if women maybe don't have to be the feelers all the time, maybe if men come toward the mi middle a little, it'll free up women to come toward the middle a little bit. But I think I'd zoom out and say, rather than thinking about it as a gendered thing, maybe we just think about it around the idea that we have to be more clear about what we need from each other. So let's say you're about to tell your partner that you had a really tough day and, um, you know, your partner is thinking of solutions already. I recommend taking a pause and, and saying to the person who's sharing, can I ask you as you're sharing this, do you want empathy or do you want solutions? Mm. Like just ask, give people a little credit to just be clear about what they need. Anytime someone comes to you and shares a tough story, if you say, I really hear you, I'm curious, do you want me to just keep you company in this tough thing? Or do you want me to help you try to fix this thing? And then let them tell you what they need. It's it's really profound. We forget that we can just ask what people want. I love that suggestion. Yeah, because I think a lot of the time I naturally go to the solve and I've caught myself doing that. And now I've got a lot better at not doing that. But sometimes someone might want solutions. So that's a great, yeah. great point. I'd love to go into another topic that I know has come up quite a lot and I'm sure you've dealt with, which is co-founder conflict. So a lot of people listen to this are either founders or people who work in businesses. And um, yeah, specifically for co-founders, I guess, is this something you come up, um, is this something you experience a lot as well? And do you have any advice for how to deal with it? Co-founder conflict is so common and it's complicated because in a way, co-founders are a little like parents who are raising this child together that is their company. And often co-founders haven't had a huge amount of time to develop a really deep relationship to understand each other's triggers and you know, what they do when they're upset and how to comfort them. And you're kind of learning that as you go. And not to mention, you're both really emotionally invested in this particular thing. And it's really easy to take things out on each other that are really about the company, all kinds of things like that. So I have a co-founder as well. And we've really put a lot of effort into taking care of our relationship in a really intentional and ongoing way. So we've done this a couple ways. Firstly, we do a monthly co-founder therapy session. It's like couples therapy, but it's with co-founders. And we go and we talk about the things that have maybe not gone as well as we wanted them to and how we can communicate better and how we can support each other better because we know that the health of our relationship is directly connected to how healthy the company is going to be. So we really invest in that. Another thing we do is called Feelings Friday. Every Friday, we spend an hour talking about how the week went and we talk about things that we felt like the other person did really well, ways we felt supported, or ways that we saw them work extra hard. And then we also share the things that maybe didn't feel like they went so well. We say, hey, I didn't really feel seen in this moment. And I really could have used more of your help at this other moment. And the reason why this is so powerful is because it happens every week, 
we know that there's going to be a space to talk to each other about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And so the rest of the week, we can really just focus on the work. Also, because it happens every week, we've prevented a lot of small problems from becoming big problems. We've cleared up miscommunications. We've prevented issues from repeating themselves because we call them out. And it also just honors the idea that we care about each other and we want to show up for each other in a particular way. So for co-founders, I'd say, don't underestimate how important you working on your relationship with your co-founder is for the success of your company. We've also come up with little ticks, uh, tips and tricks. There's something we do called, we made this word up, remojis, remote emojis, because we're talking online together so much and text is sort of tone deaf, you know, like what you're trying to convey can get lost because you're not hearing each other's tone. We came up with this system where we, come, we pick emojis that represent certain feelings and then we say, okay, from now on, when I send this emoji, it means this thing. So some examples are, you know, we'll send, like, let's say we're feeling really sensitive that day and we want the person to go a little easy on us. We'll send a baby emoji. That's the one we pick. We have a emoji for when we want to say, hey, you're doing great. I got your back. Go you. We have a emoji that means, okay, I see this message, but I don't have time to get back to it right now. I'll circle back. And we have a emoji that means like um, when you're having a conversation and, you know, let's say you're having an argument back and forth and then you pick a solution and move forward, but you don't know if the other person's really okay or not. We have a emoji that means, no, I'm not really okay. Let's talk more later. And we have a emoji that means, yeah, I'm great. Let's, let's move on. And what's amazing about these is you really start to learn them as a language and it's a really quick way to communicate to the other person what's on your mind. And we've prevented a lot of issues. Like our latest one is we came up with this system for how many peppers. So we use the little chili pepper emoji and one pepper means I'm not upset at all. And five pepper means I've never been so angry in my life. And so when we're talking about a problem, we can help them understand, is this a problem that I'm emotionally separated from or is this a problem I'm really upset about? And it's just help us deal with things so well. So I think the summary is invest in your relationship with your co-founder. Don't expect that it's always just going to go well. A marriage is not going to sustain itself forever without any work. Neither will a co-founder relationship. Have you done this similarly in your own personal life as well? Oh, yeah, definitely. These things work across the board because the truth is who you are anywhere is who you are everywhere. The relationships you have at work are going to have a similar flavor to the relationships you have outside of work because especially if you're running a startup, you care so deeply about what you're doing that you're going to bring your whole self to it. So absolutely, all of these things we've employed at our company, we also definitely use in our personal lives. Let's fast forward a little bit and people have tried this out and it's maybe not getting to a resolution or they're not really improving and they actually needs to be like a founder breakup or co-founder breakup. Are there tips that you'd, you'd give for people that are really going through that? Don't feel like the two of you have to figure it out all on your own. It's a really tough thing to navigate on your own. Enlist ideally the help of a co-founder therapist, just like I would suggest if two parents were splitting up and they had a child, it would be great for them to be in couples therapy so that their split doesn't negatively affect the child more than it has to. Same with co-founders. If you have to go separate ways, but you still want to protect the health of the company, you should probably make sure there's someone helping you do that. And if it's not a therapist, then maybe you enlist an investor you trust or friends or people in your life who you can lean on to make sure that you're not, you know, that your feelings aren't preventing you from making the decisions that will ultimately be the best for the company, for each other and for yourselves. Another thing I've heard you talk a lot about is imposter syndrome. So this is definitely something that a lot of people struggle with. Uh, and, and I'd love for you, if you could actually just define what it is for someone who hasn't heard of what that is. Um, and then it sounds like you've worked on like certain exercises people could potentially go through to to help them through that sort of um, issue they may have. Yeah, happy to. So imposter syndrome, which is something I think the vast majority of human beings experience in one way or another. But certainly if you're running a company, you're going to run into it in various you know, moments, et cetera. But imposter syndrome is a term that was coined to mean a feeling of phoniness or believing that you're not intelligent or capable, even though there's evidence of you doing really well. So you end up worrying that you're going to be exposed as a fraud or going to be found out, right? So there's this idea that you're not as good as people think you are. What's interesting is I see imposter syndrome more in people who are really capable and competent than people who are not. Because often when you're not very, 
you know, um, competent in a particular field, you don't realize how complicated that field is. So you don't even know how much you don't know you don't know. There's a term for that. It's called Dunning-Kruger symptom. And so imposter syndrome is essentially it's a cue that it's time to give yourself a little credit probably and to think about where some of this insecurity is coming from. So yeah, I have a, a whole Twitter thread. We have a whole workshop on suggestions about how to work through it. I'll throw a couple out of there. Talk about it. Seek understanding, understand what your unique breed of imposter syndrome is, where it shows up and what it looks like. Uh, one of my suggestions is stop shitting all over yourself. And by that, I mean, I should be better. I should have accomplished this. I should, I should be as good as so-and-so. It just puts you in a fixed mindset instead of a growth mindset. Another suggestion is keep a self-esteem file. All the positive feedback that comes your way, screenshot it or write it down and put it all in one place. And over time, you're going to collect this amazing data set of proof that people see your value and that you're not a fraud and that what you're doing is really important. Uh, I also recommend practice accepting compliments. We're not really good at taking in the positive feedback. And so when we think about how we're doing, we're basing it only on the negative feedback because we barely even heard the positive feedback. And then finally, one thing I say is fake it till you make it. Sometimes we have imposter syndrome because we still have a lot to learn and that's okay. And sometimes we have to tell ourselves, I'm good, I'm valuable, I'm doing the best I can and it's important work until we get to the point that we really believe it ourselves. Yeah, I think I was in a, a room with you when you were going through an exercise of accepting compliments. I don't know if you remember this, but it was it felt a little awkward because it's like 30 or 50 people who are like listening into you and one other person doing it. But um, I don't know if you remember specifically what that exercise was. But um, yeah, I'd love if you if you do, that'd be great to share. I would say people are notoriously horrible at accepting compliments. For whatever reason, we are sort of taught that we're supposed to, you know, disparage ourselves a little bit or deny it when people say good things about us. And as a result, I know, I'd say the majority of people I know are not especially good at accepting compliments. I don't know if you've seen the same thing. So I have a couple tips for how you can accept a compliment better. The first one is don't tell the person why their compliment is wrong. We do this a lot. Someone will be like, Emily, you did a great presentation. And I'll be like, oh no, I messed up three times. So what I've done is immediately told them why they're wrong about the compliment. So the first step is don't do that. The second thing we do to avoid taking a compliment is that we throw a compliment right back at the person. So someone will say, you did a great job today. And I'll say, you did a great job today. And instead of them saying thank you and taking in what they told me, I threw it right back. That's just a way of refusing a compliment. Mm -hmm. The next step after that is to actually pause and give the compliment a chance to land on you, to feel it, to actually say, wow, I'm hearing what you're saying. Thank you for allowing me to fold that into my self-concept. And then finally, and this is kind of Jedi level, if you can stand it, ask for more information. If someone gave you a negative piece of feedback, you'd probably say, okay, can you give me some examples or can you help me understand why that didn't go well? But with positive feedback, we're usually just like, oh, thanks, and we move on. But maybe you say, thank you so much for that beautiful compliment. I'd love to understand what about the presentation felt good. We're allowed to ask for more validation. It's okay to want to know that we're doing a good job. So those are the steps. So when someone gives you a compliment, practice not throwing it away or complimenting them right back and really take it in and ask for more information. Why, why do you think people do that? Why do people just throw it straight back? Is it because they're just, is it because of their self-esteem? Is it because of imposter syndrome? Because you, you, you're kind of saying, I don't really deserve this. I'm not worthy. I'm just curious from your point of view, is there a common reason for that? Or is it just very diverse depending on the person? I think there's some diversity to it. I think it can be if what the person is saying doesn't match the way you think about yourself, that's really uncomfortable. So mm. we push it away. I think it can be you're worried you'll come across as cocky or, you know, not humble enough if you say, wow, yeah, thank you. It felt good. You know, um, I think it can be if, if you've been given messages that you're not good enough your whole life, then it's really uncomfortable to suddenly hear a message that you are good enough. It's super unique in the sense, but I think at heart, we all are a little insecure and it's hard sometimes to shift that in the world. But what I want to put out there is it's a muscle that we can flex. We can come to see ourselves as good and worthy and valuable over time.
one of the most important underlying issues with all of uh, people's mental health is not dealing with their childhood and uh, if you kind of subscribe to that psychological point of view anyway um and from my understanding again as an amateur is that there's all these things that happen as you grow up even like for me someone taking the ball away in the playground and like me crying about not being in the in the cricket team or something like that when i'm like seven years old and the theory is that those things stay with you and you don't actually even know a lot of the time they're still kind of in your in your brain somewhere and you you react in the way that you may have done in the past um so i guess a, a, an important question is of course going to therapy will help with this but outside of therapy are there other things you'd recommend for people to one recollect and remember what some of those things were and then kind of start to heal some of those things well, I definitely do subscribe to this theory, but I think it's more complicated than just tough things happen in our childhood and now we're affected by it as an adult. I think about it more about the, around the idea that your childhood was the blueprint that you built your life on. And everything that happened in your childhood affected you when you were a little older. And then all of that affected you when you were a little older and a little older. And now you're this adult and you are built on this foundation of all of this stuff that originated when you were young and when you had less say in your life and when other people were making decisions for you, all kinds of things like that. So I do think that to deny that who we were when you we were young, of course, affects who we are now. I think that's a big oversight. In terms of how to face it and deal with it, obviously, I think therapy is the best way. This is a really hard thing to do on our own or we would have already done it. But I think it's just about being willing to look at tough things being willing to examine your patterns, asking for feedback. Actually, my co-founder just did something where she created this survey about herself saying, in what ways does it feel really good to be with me? In what ways does it not feel good to be with me? What suggestions can you give me to be a better friend or co-founder, whatever it is to you? And she sent this to a few trusted people in her life. And she said it was really profound to see how she was being perceived by people and to use that to learn about herself. So being willing to you know, solicit perspective from other people, doing things like journaling. And so you can examine your patterns. I actually have this line a day journal. It's a journal where it's just one line for you to write each day, but then it has five years worth, right? So you write one line and then you go back and you write one, one line on the next page. So by the end, you can see what you wrote on that day for the past five years. And it's really powerful because what you start to realize is, oh, wow, I really have patterns. It seems like actually Thanksgiving's a lot more stressful to me than I realized because I seem to be really upset when Thanksgiving's <laughs> coming up every year. Maybe there's something there for me to examine. So the more you see, the more you can change. The more you know about yourself, the more agency you have over your life. So do all the exploration you can. Find community who wants to support you in that. It's never too late to start. Around therapy. So we've talked all about why people should go to therapy. Um, I wish we kind of lived in a world where it was not stigmatized and everyone has access to it and it's affordable. So I'm curious, like looking, if I gave you a crystal ball and you could look way into the future and I gave you a magic wand to fix systemic problems that would allow us to get there, like what do we need to do to get to that place where everyone is able to get that help? I think we need to get to a place where society values proactive mental health work enough to know that it's going to prevent a lot of issues down the line. So for example, companies are starting to pay for gym memberships because they know that it's going to end up costing more if the person gets sick and they can't come to work than if they just took care of themselves in the first place. I think becoming a therapist has to become less expensive. It's so expensive to become a therapist that by the time you've graduated, you can't necessarily afford to see people for a low fee. You have to charge a certain amount and insurance doesn't yet value how important it is so they don't cover enough of it. So I think the first step is showing society what a huge difference it makes and ultimately how much it's gonna affect the bottom line if we do invest in these kinds of things so that we can change the system such that going to therapy is as much a right and as much of an accessible option as going to public school or any of the other services that we've decided are a necessary part of being a functional human. Alyssa, Emily, I know this was a, a rapid fire conversation, but you've really shared so many nuggets in such a short amount of time. So I really appreciate you going through all of that. And people can check you out on Twitter. You're amazing on Twitter. You're one of my favorite followers. So oh, thank you. it's at Dr. Emily Anhol. Um, I will add that to the screen here so people can uh, follow you and join Coa.com. 
um, I'd love to make sure we do this again and we can explore some more topics together. That sounds great. Thank you so much. You're a lovely host and it's been wonderful to be here. Thank you.